And now on to our next speaker. Dennis Meadows, we've heard you on one panel already, so just a short introduction. You are an emeritus professor of systems management and widely known for the book The Limits to Growth, which came out in 1972 and is concerned with exponential growth in a world with finite resources. Please, Professor, go ahead. Good afternoon, Julia and Martin. Thank you for inviting me to join your seminar today. Climate change is certainly an existential problem for our species, and I admire very much uh, your efforts to organize a large number of people to do something about it in a way which generates a very small amount of uh, new greenhouse gas emissions. I've been thinking about the issues related to climate change for 40 years, and I'd like to share with you a few thoughts today. In 1972, our first book already published data on the rise of greenhouse gas emissions, especially CO2, and the corresponding increase in the concentration in the atmosphere. Back then, the uh, atmosphere had about 320 parts per million of CO2 in it, but it was growing rapidly, and of course today it's over 400, and the rate of growth is even faster. We're as was pointed out by a UN report last year, now at levels that haven't been seen uh, in the last three million years. Why is that? With all the thousands of conferences, the books, the meetings, uh, the Kyoto Accord, the efforts to ratify and implement the Kyoto Accord and the follow-up meetings, still CO2 emissions are going up faster than ever before. If we don't understand the answer to that question, our efforts to reduce it are not going to be very effective. As someone once said, if you keep uh, going in the same direction, you're going to get where you were going, not uh, in some new place. So what uh, directions uh, do we need to change in order to be more effective? Well, the common idea about climate control is that CO2 emissions uh, influence the biosphere health. And by biosphere health, we mean many things, uh, species, uh, diversity, the uh, level of sea level, uh, the uh, stability of the thermofrost, uh, acidity of the oceans, uh, the uh, degree of variance and precipitation of winds, and so forth. As the emissions go up, generally the biosphere health uh, declines, and the common idea is that as it goes down, control policies will start up, and after a while, they will uh, bring CO2 emissions back down. Well, this common idea is based on what I might call the one bathtub model of uh, the biosphere. Uh, CO2 emissions fill the atmosphere, and they uh, lead to a certain level of biosphere health. If the CO2 emissions go up, the uh, biosphere health goes down, and the common idea is that quickly there will be consensus, policy, and reductions. This uh, is based on uh, a common idea which leads to several implications. First, uh, that we can start to reduce CO2 emissions after we see a decline in biosphere health, and that the goal really needs only to be to lower emissions. Uh, it assumes that declining biosphere health is quickly perceived, that everyone will agree uh, on the damage, that there will be consensus we need to do something, and that we will quickly uh, develop control policies that we are effective. And then once we do that, biosphere health will quickly improve after the emissions are reduced. Unfortunately, all of these assumptions are false. Holding them has led us to implement a set of policies that just haven't worked. That's because there are four important delays we haven't been taking into account. CO2 emissions does influence the concentration in the atmosphere after a delay. Science is still a little ambiguous on this point, but the consensus is that uh, it takes 20 to 80 years uh, to elim begin eliminating CO2 emissions uh, that have uh, been put into the atmosphere. 
It means that if we were to stabilize the growth in CO2 emissions, CO2 concentration would continue to rise for a century or more. And of course, as the CO2 concentration goes up, uh, biosphere health begins to go down. Pam did a wonderful job of explaining some of the delays there, talking about thousands or millions of years and even irreversibilities, which of course are infinite delays. As the biosphere health goes down, there is a, an emerging political consensus, but it's also delayed. We see that it took uh, many years before the Kyoto Accord emerged out of the initial climate change convention um, a framework of the UN. And then it took uh, more years still for enough nations to ratify it, to bring it into effect. And then of course, shortly thereafter, Canada withdrew and now the United States has announced its intentions to withdraw. What the delay is between political consensus and CO2 emissions, we really don't know because so far we haven't been able to implement any uh, policies to bring those CO2 emissions back down. Because of these four delays, it really means uh, that we need uh, not a one bathtub, but a three bathtub model. Of course, CO2 emissions don't in themselves cause damage. Uh, as CO2 emissions go up, they increase the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. That doesn't heat the atmosphere. The atmosphere is heated by heat coming in from the sun, which has been more or less constant. But as the concentration goes up, the heat radiation declines. And with a constant input, that means that the heat in the atmosphere starts to go up. It's that which is causing ecological disruption uh, of the sort which has been uh, already described. As that goes up, the biosphere health goes down, and then we can hope that there will be consensus which generates policies and reductions. But now we're looking at a loop which is centuries in length. Imagine that you were trying to control the level of this bathtub, the third one, with using a faucet which was up here. Uh, it would be almost impossible, and in fact, the job has so far turned out to be beyond the capacities of our economic and our political system. The policy implications of this more complex understanding are that when we see declining biosphere health, it's already too late to avoid serious damage. And uh, means that we really have to reduce CO2 emissions before there's widely observed damage. That's one of the reasons we don't have much time. And we don't need just simply to reduce CO2 emissions. We need to bring them down below the rate at which CO2 is absorbed by biomass, by the ocean, and so forth. A Japanese uh, prime minister once said, if you're not able to understand the cause of a problem, it's probably impossible to solve it. I'd paraphrase that a little bit in this case. If you aren't able to understand the cause of a problem soon enough, it's impossible to understand it. Soon enough is not far in the future. We don't have much time. So I hope that your program will be very effective and I'm eager to provide whatever assistance I can. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. Business as usual means about four degrees warmer, which is approximately one ice age in the opposite direction. Based on today's temperatures, we are going to hit two meters of sea level rise, no matter what. We are in a race against time. It takes a double whammy to understand. It takes repeated shocks. We need a global movement that demands real change. We don't have time to speculate. We don't have time is absolutely correct. As we know, we don't have time. There's no more time. Yes, we don't have time. We use the hashtag. We don't have time. We don't have much time. We don't have time to wait.